All right. Hello, everyone. We are back, joined again by good friend of the show, Fred, in jolly old England. Hello, Fred. Hello. 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 I uh, hope you're doing well there and uh, in the, the with the land of the, the Big Ben and gin and beef eater hats and um, other things. Uh, not, not so much these days. Yeah. Uh, the beef eater hats and the gin. Uh, but um, as in, in terms of it being so quintessential, the land like, of sticker laws yeah. and uh, and uh, and uh, like gr- grime music and yeah. and curry and stuff, you know. Yeah, it's uh, Stormzy um, and Curry. That's what it is. Um, uh, it's what it is, bro. Isn't it? Um, anyhow, um, so. Uh, our transatlantic rivalry aside, uh, we we brought you on because you are aside from being a good friend of the show, you had a really amazing. I thought it was an amazing tweet. It was very succinct and to the point, all about the uh, the law. Well, about the law in France enshrining abortion as a constitutional right, but really also I, the way I interpreted the tweet. So you can, I'll put you on trial just a little bit here. The way I interpreted your tweet was that you were sort of more commenting on the way that the celebrations were going about and the, the fact that there was this uh, projection of an e- the English phrase hashtag with the hashtag to hashtag my body, my choice on the Eiffel Tower. And that it not only is that France is celebrating a culture, they're officially become a culture of death, um, but also that they're using English progressive phrases. And uh, you and I went back and forth a little bit, not disagreeing, I don't think, but just sort of uh, commenting that like, it's not just an English phrase, as you had quite rightly said, it's an American English phrase. And I was personally called out about that and I couldn't disagree. I was like, yeah, I know you're totally right. Um, so I thought this is um, an example of semiotics in action. Um, uh, and so I thought I'd bring you on and enough humming and hawing. Um, it's your tweet. It's your opinion. It, it was a good it was a good tweet. So we can use it as a jumping off point. Um, um, yeah, like. Uh, explain it i guess like is, is a way to start not to put you on the spot too much but um because i mean i i i think i know what you were, were saying but like it's straight from the horse's mouth right so of course no uh, yeah so i mean i i tweet a lot and a lot of it is quite whimsical or, or i try and i see a thing and i try to give like a a really intelligent take on it i try my best to say things i try my best to say things that other people have not framed a certain thing in a certain way i have i have this tendency to try and try and try and say a thing about a particular thing that other people have not i try and i try and come at new angles that sometimes it means i might be doing it for its own sake a bit too much but uh you know i try and say different things and um so yeah there was this this thing that's happened in france which i wasn't following before it happened very much Apparently, France is the first country to enshrine the right to an abortion in its constitution. I mean, I don't think that's quite true. I mean, isn't wasn't when Roe v. Wade was yeah when Roe v. Wade was in was in enforced? Surely, isn't doesn't that mean it would make it, abortion a constitutional right? Effectively, so, uh, maybe so, not yeah. officially, but effectively, yes, right in practice. Yes, yeah. yeah. So yeah. because obviously constitutions can be changed. So the fact yep. that it was overturned doesn't mean that it wasn't constitutionally enshrined. I mean, constitutions can be changed. Yep. You know, any earthly political arrangements are fickle at the end of the day, so they should not be, you know, seen as these great eternal things so much. Um, but that's another topic. Anyway, so yeah, there's and the, there was a picture of the Eiffel Tower, uh, which was you know at night, and there was a there's that thing where the Eiffel Tower flashes twinkly lights. It's like 10 p.m. every day or something like that. I've seen it once or twice before. Um, last time I went to Paris, I'm actually going to Paris this year, <laughs> not for the Olympics, but um, for a, a a singing engagement. I, I sing in a in a choir, and we're going to Paris in August. Anyway, um, and I've not been to Paris since 2014. I prefer to go to the south of France. Anyway, uh, yeah, there was um, this uh, projected mess uh, words saying hashtag. First of all, there's a hashtag. Yeah. Why do people put hashtag on physical written signs all the time? This has been a thing for like 10 years now, and it's very weird. 
I have very weird. We, you, yeah, when it, when it, when it, when you pass the talking stick back to me, I have some semiotic ideas about why the, the sure. hashtag. We, we can. It symbolizes something, but yeah, we'll keep going. We can, we can, we can go into that. Yeah. Just because I, it would be good to go into that, and then it says in English, "My body, my choice," and um, that I found strange because it's in English. Yeah. And France is not. Well, I was going to say, when I think of an English. Uh, ang Anglophile <laughs> cultures, I think of, of, of the French, they just really love and when you show yes. up and you speak English and you only speak English. And even if you understand French, you still get, respond in English. You just, yeah, they love it when you do that. So. It's weird because, okay, I get the impression that the people that are the strongest advocates for abortion today, wh wherever they are, whether because I think abortion is an issue that captures people and can really kind of transcend nationhood so that an abortion advocate in one place will just be so similar to one in another in terms of their broader kind of uh passions and well they have a shared and religion that, and that yes and that will usually transcend if not shun the idea of nationhood yeah. like I'm, th I'm thinking of these protests these rallies for abortion that there were in argentina last year or the year before i can't remember where there were just these I mean, like I've been I've been looking back at the footage just in preparation for this of what was happening in Paris, and it's got me looking back at some other footage. In last... It's actually just so sickening to look at it because you have these people sort of celebrating in the street. Some of them are actually crying. These women are like crying from, you know, crying from happiness in the streets that they can. In, in Argentina I, specifically. I thought, in Argentina, I saw that. In France, I wouldn't be surprised. If, there were yeah. some people. So, well, in France, they're literally sort of celebrating, and and the ones in Ireland, I think it was 2019. I can't remember when the uh, Article Eight, whatever it was called, in Ireland, basically sort of legalized abortion in Ireland for the first time ever, or something like that. And um, and the, just these celebrations from all these women, whilst they otherwise tell you that you know no no one's in favour of abortion. We just want to, you know, uh, we just want to like, um, uh, what is it? Curtail the negative consequences of restrictions. You know, we need to release the pressure valve a bit. I mean, of course, then the way they act at these protests is just, you know, it's 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 just really sickening. It's really quite well, disgusting. I was going to say and, that um, in my mind, as you're watching the Argentina footage, particularly, there's like a an internal like. Um, British flag waving in the wind over the Falklands and God Save the Queen playing in the background as you are just feel totally justified in, uh, <laughs> in just, like this is why we fought the yeah. war or something. Like well, I'm, yeah. I mean, the the Fal like the Falklands could uh, has its own sort of independent policy. The the Falklands is a British overseas territory and they have their own more independent policy with regards to kind of controversial issues like abortion. Or like same-sex marriage. There was this. There was this long controversy in Bermuda, which is a British overseas territory, which means it's under the crown but independent from Westminster, where they kept going back and forth on legalizing and illegalizing same-sex marriage. So in theory, that could be the Falklands could have like an independent policy on abortion, which is quite funny. Anyway, um, and hopefully in Argentina that gets overturned under Millet because of Millet all this, seems to be he despite seems pretty him pro. being this limp this uh, libertarian crazy person which people criticize him for he is unrepentantly anti-abortion yeah which is just which is a very good litmus test of whether you have a self-described libertarian who yeah is is just has some sort of just some sort of reassurance about them so so that is and i would be i would love for that to be overturned that would just be wonderful and <laughs> because then they'd be really crying in the street wouldn't they yes anyway um and yeah, oh, their so tears what... their tears are salty and they're really good for seasoning food sure yes that yeah. would be what we could season our food with you know yeah anyway what was my actual tweet i should have said this at the start apologies for rambling so it was a picture of the eiffel tower with my body my choice it was just a picture even though the words did, there was more the words displayed it would changed a bit and i said why is it in english my first interpretation of this is that this is a stark example of the pizza effect. Modern feminism, as we know it, gets pioneered by Simone de Beauvoir. It gets developed in America and then gets imported back to France like so. 
So that's just one way of looking at this. And it's me just, it is me trying to kind of be a bit sort of flexy. It's like, oh, I know all these things. I thought things, it was insightful. You know, and, you know, so I'm not an expert on Spoon, Spoon Revoir. I, you I don't have, have these... to be. <laughs> well, remember, I, remember you, what so... Gandalf would warn you is don't study too closely the works of the enemy. So you, you study it enough to know don't what it too is. Cl- yes. You don't go too no, close. I, yeah. I, I, it's like, it's like, you know, how it was like, oh, you, oh, you, you're criticizing Marx for this. Have you read like these, this thousand page book? No. Why would I do that? <laughs> Why would I read this thousand page book of nonsense? Have you read fact, every probably, single satanic probably, incantation? He probably yeah. wrote, he probably deliberately wrote this thousand page book just so he could deflect his critics from not having read it. It's like, no, fuck off. Well, it, it, it's the, anyway, uh, it's, the um, it's the, it's the, it's the Necronomicon. You don't read from it. Are you crazy? No. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I just, I, yeah, I don't need to, I don't need to be an expert too. But yeah, for, from my understanding, Simone de Beauvoir is a pioneer of second wave feminism because every, because obviously wrote her book, The Second Sex, in 1949. And then every subsequent popular second wave feminist writer, be they um, Betty Friedan, Jermaine Greer, Kate Millett, um, you know, they all just they all just say Simone de Beauvoir, Simone de Beauvoir. And even even um uh, Judith Butler, she's a postmodern feminist. She's a postmodern gender feminist, but she brings everything back to Simone de Beauvoir. Even she recently wrote an article in defense of transgenderism because there'd been all these TERFs, so-called TERFs, who had been these radical feminists who are critical of transgenderism. And she was bringing things back to Simone de Beauvoir. So she's like Jesus, basically. Uh, and she's like feminist Jesus. And, you know, people say, and so Simone de Beauvoir was essentially the sort of feminist reference points as far as any of us today are concerned you know people might say oh but what about these more meaningful people like mary wollstonecraft you know i mean the these people were not around around the time that feminism as we know and care about it exists and secondly she was before the term even existed the term was coined by a man very funny uh charles fourier who is a notorious is a notorious French utopian socialist. And he had all sorts of insanely crazy ideas about sex and sexual liberation. Just really cosmic (laughs) interpretations of sexual liberation. He would talk about like the planets and the sexual libido of just insane stuff. And- um, That sounds almost like Aleister Crowley to me. (laughs) Most likely. And as far as, before Simone de Beauvoir, she, but she herself was essentially basing everything she wrote about, you know, feminist class struggle, which is what it, it's a class struggle. It's uh, it because it has more fel- it has more camaraderie with fellow class struggles than it does with other merely women centered things. Like you'll hold, constantly have feminists talking about racism and homosexuals and stuff like that as opposed to just merely women-centered things like i don't know uh religious sisters nunneries or 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 motherhood things to do with motherhood you know just it's more it has more to do with class struggle than women definitively anyway but yeah so simone de Beauvoir also just basically bases everything she knows on angles and marx himself had also written about women's oppression he he didn't just write about obviously people think marx is not woke as it were because he just wrote about economic class struggle but he um uh, he did touch on women's oppression and engels touched on it much more because he wrote this big book called uh the origin of the family which is basically the feminist work that as far as we are all concerned today because it was what kick-started Simone de Beauvoir's work and everyone else so um so yeah basically feminism was invented by men that's as far as we're concerned that's what we should mean anyway so this that was my basis for so it's a fem whether we say feminism as we know it was invented in France 
well, either that or in Germany by things based. Isn't it always the idealist. continent? Wouldn't you agree with me on this? It, it's always no, it the is, continent. It is, it is the continent, yes. I mean, people can argue there were various liberal English philosophers that influenced them, but, you know, most stuff, as far as we are concerned, are from the continent. You know, they, they, uh, they kind of cooked the ideas in a way that have influenced us as far as we now are concerned. Timelessly is, you know, maybe not timelessly, but as far as we are concerned right now, sitting talking today you know yeah um seeing chronically and and in the, the moment. pizza always, yeah. i said the pizza effect because the pizza effect is this idea of how pizza was exported from italy to america by italian immigrants maybe before that as well maybe someone brought it back i don't know and then pizza was changed in america from what it originally was i can't i don't know sure what it originally was but it's but pizza as we know it it's is very american. different yeah, and then Italians in Italy now make pizza in an American way. There's well, so and what? But, well, I was just gonna say, but it's but pizza has always been, um, gl how well globalist is a loaded term. It's always been transatlantic because of the use of of pomodoro, right? So tomatoes. So it's a new. It's mm. it's got this sauce. That's a that's a new world plant. So it it's mm. it is just like always back and forth. It keeps and every time it crosses, it kind of it changes every single time. So, sure. which underscores your point, right? Like I'm, it, that, that it sure. has always done this, like, right? So mm -hmm. a flat bread, a wheat flatbread is very Mediterranean, right? Wheat flatbread, mm. it's yeah. a very Mediterranean yeah, is, yeah. kind of thing. And then you get, whoa, this sauce from the new, with this, with this weird fruit thing from the new world. Okay, no, this is our thing, it's Italians now. Oh, it's our, it's our pizza. Oh, we bring it to the new world back again. Oh, okay, we're gonna make deep dish and we're gonna do weird shit and we're gonna be Americanized about it. And we're gonna get like, the other day I had like gorgonzola pizza, amazing by the way, but you would never get that in Italy traditionally. And then, but yeah, and then now that is sort of starting, as much as the Italians hate it, it is influencing the way they make their food. Like they're, they can't help but yes. react to the pressure of this is now what quote unquote pizza is, right? So. Yes, I, I can't, I don't actually remember, don't know what pizza, real pizza is, as in sort of authentic I think pizza, it's like, I should, it's I like don't know. It's like thin crust with some, Tomato based sauce, I think, is it and like that's I, a, I think it's pretty I simple. I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure if it definitively had tomato on it. Oh, okay. Well maybe it did um, Okay. But tomato based yeah. sauces are popular <laughs> in Italian cuisine. Yes. After the point when well, tomatoes start getting brought over and and grown in Europe. So Sure. Like, yeah. yeah. Like they it it's not it's not I mean, th I guess this is this gets to the issue of like what is real fill in the of blanks course. you know yeah. like it, it's always like in what point in time and what place in space time are you talking about right like so pizza is even something else before it's something different now um that doesn't mean that you don't have an opinion about it we're not postmodernists here but it is in you know it's like it's things are always changing whether that's the idea of a food or the idea of 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 what a woman is yeah. idea of whatever you know it's always like where are you talking about so well people People are constantly trying to essential, okay, against their imp colonial bourgeois enemies. Only that they're trying to find these, they're essentializing yeah. these things. So, for example, tea, a cup of tea in England. People like to say, "Oh, tea is not grown in England. Tea is an imperial construct." Blah blah blah. Tea isn't British. It was like, okay, but the way tea is prepared and cured and served yeah it's very unique is 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 a cult is a is a culture very british is yeah. a cultural thing tea doesn't come out of the ground in no. bags i don't cured and cured <laughs> in that way you know <laughs> i thought it did I would, i'd love i'd love i'd love i'd love it if i could pick tea bags off a tree you know something like that yeah um, you're, that's british heaven tea, you and C.S. Lewis so, are just like picking tea bags off of trees and stuff like that. Exactly. So yeah, tea. Lovely. So tea, yeah. tea, yeah. tea served in you know with milk and with sugar and uh, right. you know in is is a British. The way we have tea is obviously different from the way people have tea in Turkey or oh yeah China. You know yeah yeah very different. The, the way the way the leaves are cured will be different. Maybe yeah. the way they're seasoned is different. I mean. I don't know. I don't. There's know fermentation, but yeah. but yeah, you can get like funky. Yes. Uh, so ferment, fermented tea from China, which is good. I like it, but yeah, it's just it's different. It's not so, the same thing. You would never put that, milk so, sugar into a pu'er or something like that. Yeah. No, exactly. I it. think milk in tea is a very 
is a is a big oddity. Yeah, as as oddity. <laughs> ah. Um. Uh. So yeah. So yes, tea is British when done in this particular way. Well, there, so there is sort of a sen- there's there is centralizing tea leaves. Yes. Yes, and and I know that we're we're it's a little bit of an aside, but I have to since you're touting, you know, again in my mind, there's God Save the Queen and a and a Union Jack flying in the background, and I'm about to you know. Pu- you got to turn on America. Fuck yeah, for me and with stars and stripes and an eagle. Mm. Uh, the uh, the like like coffee, right? Like coffee is another example of this, where you're like, yes. coffee. When people, you know, oh, coffee's, you know, it's Middle Eastern. You'll hear people say that. I'm like, well, originally, yeah. I mean, the beans originate from what, like Ethiopia, the Horn, oh, Ethiopia region, from, generally speaking, somewhere from there. Africa, Africa, think, Horn yeah. of Africa. But it's made very differently in different, like, so, like, an espresso yes. from Italy is not the same thing as what, like, Ethiopian coffee is. And by the way, Ethiopian no. coffee, uh, Ethiopian coffee is very good, but it's just something very different. Sure. And then you go yeah. to like, you know, uh, to, you know, Seattle, a Seattle, even an espresso in Seattle tastes a lot different, uh, different than an espresso in Italy, because, yeah, it's like, you know, oftentimes it's the same machine, it's the same, you know, espresso machines that are being used, but the grind, the roast, the grind, all the the flavor profiles that people like in um, like Pacific, I, you know, tout my own, the, the, the one of the few good things my city has produced is some really fucking amazing coffee, but it's very different. And it's not like when I, I like, one of the things I like about when I go to Europe is that the coffee is very good, but it's very different. It's like the, the roast, the grind, everything. It's like, it's a completely different experience. Technically it's just like espresso, right? In both places, but it's not the same. It's just to underscore this point of like, yeah. it always depends where you are and it is okay to have something that, exists in multiple places around the world also be distinctly like british tea is not chinese tea right like no. seattle espresso is not italian espresso and that's i don't that's think fine i don't i don't think many chinese would want to admit that despite the Ch- so there would be various chinese people hung up about i don't know the opium wars or something but they would not the sort of people to say tea is not british but they would not want the way for tea is served in britain they would not want to lay claim to would they yeah, it was exactly. like okay if you want if you want tea to not be british and you want to essentialize everything you want tea to be chinese then you can have british tea which you probably hate because it's not the way you serve tea exactly well you don't want that well fuck off then yeah Culture pretty much is real. well and yeah. this is the this is the tech i mean i'm a half i'm half i'm a dual citizen with texas as i like to say and mm. uh and, and tex-mex is the same thing tex-mex isn't like sure. mexican Nobody cares. Everyone knows that. That's why it's great because it's different. Yeah, sure. Any- it's the same with it's the same with yeah. curry as well. I mean, curry. curry yeah, is, curry yeah. is a basically a British invention. Yep. And it will the way it's served in Britain is so consistent that there's no way that it can be representative of the ver the vast the vast plurality of you know the way dish- dishes are served in India. Right. Or in the Indian subcontinent, which is very vast and varied. Well, and you can so extend it to Thailand curry. as well. I mean, Thai curry is something exactly. completely different than, than exactly. Indian so curry. it's yeah, yeah. So it's so no these just because these have spices and seasonings that are grown from the ground, usually from elsewhere, like the the culture the the culture of a given region is how you how what you do with these essentially in, in, these raw materials and the raw ingredients and uh the way we do it will be different from the way it's done in an actual indian or bengali place you know so yeah so fuck so fuck off basically <laughs> i agree no it's and, people um, retarded yeah <laughs> so so let's go back to talking about feminism because i as far as i'm concerned so simone de Beauvoir is this big pioneer of, of feminism she, she sort of changed it up a bit from uh from what from what angles originally because she she took these uh idealist these german idealist notions and just made them more explicitly you know about women rather than having them just be derivative of capitalistic relations and i mean she was a communist like she this is part of my thing why i think she's one of the most evil women in the world she entertained these uh audiences with uh with uh, Chairman Mao, with her horrible, disgusting lover, what's his name, Sartre, horrible paedophile lover. She was a paedophile as well. Her and Sartre used to traffic their teenage students and, you know, do terrible I, things. Well, not anyway, surprised, but I didn't know um, that. Yeah. She, she used to, uh, she used to entertain the audiences of, or be, be, may have an audience of Chairman Mao, of, uh, 
Fidel Castro, I think, um, pretty sure. And um, she was a pedophile and she was just, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about the French resistance and, you know, communist sympathies, both before and after the revelation of the Stalinist purges existed. And um, yeah, this is this is a thing I, I, I was saying before we started recording. It's a thing me and my sister have a bit of a, a disagreement about because my sister did English and French at Oxford and she um, she's read a lot of Simone Bar's work, including the you know the fiction that's not necessarily to do with feminism and then her non-fiction work as well and i you know i say this is the most evil woman of the 20th century and she sort of rolls her eyes it's like well, you don't understand you haven't read all this stuff and it's like do i need to read all this stuff do i, do I really need to read all this stuff anyway um <laughs> i really want to buy her this book called dangerous liaisons which goes into the full this book called dangerous liaisons which go into the full details of the just disgustingly turbulent relationship between her and Sartre and like these disgusting things she would do to kind of get his attention just uh, awful awful people anyway um what you're trying to say is she's a net she's a nasty woman a real nasty piece of work a nasty woman and yeah. then there'll be loads of people listening be like oh i am a nasty woman oh <laughs> yeah. you you're you're, I'm a you're nasty a fucking bitch. you're a fucking <laughs> child sex trafficker yeah. Good for you, girl. Good for you, babe. <laughs> you girl boss. Good for you. Anyway. Um and so Sonimo was Simone Rivo was very influential in America, and you know, people like Kate Millett, people like Shulamith Firestone, um who were writing all this stuff, who in English departments in America. The first women's studies department was in Albany, I think, in the seventies, and um, there's there's this very funny anecdote from Camille Paglia where she goes to this dinner um, for the opening of this first women's studies department, and it was in Albany. And she says, "We had like a dinner, and we didn't get through the dessert. Let me tell you, because we had this screaming argument about hormones." <laughs> they deny that hormones didn't have the slightest effect on human life. They said humans didn't even exist. <laughs> These are women of the English department. This is very funny. Your your um, your American yeah, woman voice is outstandingly funny. <laughs> I'm trying I'm trying I'm trying to do my Camille Paglia because she has this extremely distinct voice. You know? Yeah. Um yeah, but no, it's a very funny anecdote. And so these were so these are English departments. And um you know, a lot of these feminists were literary or English graduates. Jermaine Greer was an English teacher as much as an English graduate, I think. So a lot of these women haven't dabbled much into, you know, real science, but they can write it off because they think that there's this theory of social construction of knowledge from a feminist perspective where, you know, knowledge is constructed with a male bias so they can write it off, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you need to read, if you read the chapter gender, the opening chapter of the female unit by Jermaine Greer, it's basically this massive kind of um, denunciation of the scientific claims about, you know, sex differences and or of the significance of them. She's like talking about how protozoa have three combinate have chromosome combinations, you know. Therefore, let's let's have a social revolution and just nullify all of human history. It's just like if you read that and you think, why is why is this woman disagreeing with transgenderism if she believes in this complete, you know, revolutionary denunciation of of natural sex differences? Why is she coming under fire against transgenderism today? It's completely hypocritical. Um, the well, the revolution went too far. Exactly. No, I am so sick to death of people giving the benefit of the doubt to like J.K. Rowling and. This other woman called Julie Bindle, she's this awful, like, just the most stereotypical, man-hating, butch, bitter, lesbian, radical feminist. She's like the absolute stereotype of all this stuff, the absolute archetype, like the kind of Plato's cave of, like, all of Portland, radical, Oregon. like, of 
except she's from she's from the north of England. She's English. So it's like yeah. She's 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 <laughs> like she's like the absolute epitome of all this stuff. It's actually quite amazing that she even ex- I actually kind of admire her a little bit for just being ticking all these boxes just so, you know. Anyway, she's a meme come to life. Ex- exactly. It's it's really an embodied really quite, egregore. Quite amazing. Yeah. And like she has there's this quite this historical guardian article that she wrote titled why i hate men and it's just like thank you for just <laughs> being so perfectly living up to your role your your gender role or oh, something like that yeah. ironically um anyway well we've gone a bit off topic now yeah, um, well, it, the, so this, the, the this, re- stuff, the, the, this stuff the went to america yeah the reimportation and then from america yeah, and yeah. then so most of this stuff gets imported back to england or back to europe by uh, the aftermath of the Second World War, where uh, Roosevelt has used the chaos of war to steal the thunder of all these European powers, especially Britain, uh, but more in particular France, and um, not so much Spain, I don't think, but certainly England and more probably France as well. And uh, you know, there needs to be more debates about whether there's we should be more angry at Roosevelt for doing it actively or more angry at Churchill for being more passive about it, or both at the same time. Anyway, uh, so a lot of American values, which, or as in American values at this well, given time. American progressive values, like, because... Sure. That's a very... Okay, this, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a broad brush there, because the, yes. the values that are being pushed are not really, like, I think you can make the at the risk of essentialism. I think that those are, at the time, were not the values held by the vast majority of Americans. I think that they were the values no. of the American intelligentsia. Uh, they were elite values. Yeah, that's elite true. values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these elite values, which... And this is, yeah, this is my criticism of America as a concept is that because it's a colony, because there's not much, you know, true rooted history, it there's more legitimacy for what constitutes American values to be turned on its head quite easily and, you know, and still still have that be legitimate. I mean, you know, I understand that might be controversial, but yeah, I might agree. There's, with some, you. there's something in that, like, it's just been sh- given how easily it has been for the founding ideas of America to just be so radically turned on their head and for there to be little controversy about this. I just, you know. It's pronounced controversy, something... but I agree with you. Con- so, yes, no, I did. Yeah, I, did say wrong. <laughs> I do. I did say it wrong there. Yeah. I, it's um, just the British way of saying I'm just giving you there shit. Is, there's something there's something in that and something i think we've talked about is how i think a lot of sort of german idealist ideas were a strong basis for the way lib- what was called liberalism became defi- redefined in the yeah. late 19th century especially in america especially with uh, the um kind of philosopher king mon- rule of uh what's his name frederick Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, yeah. Okay. Who We're was, talking German or know, American? First, like, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first yeah. the first American president with a PhD and wrote extensively about, you know, administrative government replacing yeah. democratic government in the way that democratic government replaced monarch monarchical rule, absolute yeah. monarchs. So uh and he sees this administrative government as being a kind of final form of this evolution. And um, uh, the way things have pan out in both America and Europe has been profoundly similar to that, in my opinion. We now have this sovereign administration, which is separate from both parliaments and certainly of mon- monarchs that still exist. Well, um, are there monarchs left in Europe? I mean, well, yes, uh, but they're, they're, they're monarchs. I'll, I'll, monarchs, I'll turn but, that, yeah. that, that critique back on your <laughs> Your country is like that's great, but you haven't had a real monarch until since like probably Queen Anne or well, something well, like that. So fine. Well, <laughs> well, I will say there is more. Queen Victoria was more um, intrusive than people would have thought yes. about. People yes. look at Queen Victoria and they see, they project a lot of what they think about Elizabeth II onto Queen Victoria. Yeah, but Queen Elizabeth II being extremely reserved is more 
her thing. Yeah. Queen Victoria was quite uh, in, um, intrusive against Gladstone and his anti-imperial ambitions. She actually did quite a lot was in, uh, that was in her power to be in, in intrusive to him. And I think she was quite successful on a number of occasions. So, so With the as, exception as perhaps of Victoria, yeah. Yeah. So as well as late as Queen, I don't know about um, her predecessors, her, med- her immediate predecessors, but certainly as recently as Queen Victoria has the monarch tried to, you know, tried to, right? But it's an, but it's to a, strengthen it's, their hand a little bit. Yeah, but it's the, even the, then the, it's her pushing against the tide, right? Like that that, that is already sure. going. Yeah, definitely against that kind the of first. Uh, yeah, the first and the second world war certainly have solidified the, you know, the the you know that the monarchs should know their place yep in 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 England because the Americans were now in charge essentially in terms of they were setting setting the rules well and, monarchs um, and, you know british monarchs got to know their place because americans were always worried about the germans you know coming back to power so anyhow sure yeah no yeah yeah i mean they changed their name and everything and they had to yeah. be careful about the german sympathies and stuff um but then it's later on it's also interesting to see the kind of disconnect between Nazism and German monarchy and whether or not there was such a, a difference between two. I need to read more about it. But anyway. Um so yeah, the, the context of the aftermath of the Second World War allowed for American cultural export to to Europe through um a lot through actually the UN as far as I'm concerned, a lot through UNESCO. And through these these ideas of promoting sort of global liberal values, uh, which just all I'm I'm meaning to read more, but all of it sort of comes out of this kind of distinctly German idealist understanding of liberalism. Because I, I some people think that there is a, that that is the essence of things like the Dec- Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That this has a distinctly kind of Prussian essence about it, and um, so that's that's where I think more the essence of it comes. But um, and this must be where we get to now with uh, these this usage of English in in France, uh, in, in Paris, in, 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 in but, Paris, but like, on the Eiffel another... Tower. <laughs> exactly, like. <laughs> Like this, the, Paris is like the epicenter of these radical liberation, liberationary, if that's a word, ideas. So why do they need to? Why do they need to have English there? To I'm pretty sure it. the. So so yes, on this on this uh, projection on the Eiffel Tower, there's my body, my choice. There's also mon, mon corps, mon choix. Mon corps, mon choix. Yeah, yeah. Mon corps, mon choix. And then there so a direct was, uh, translation. From the English, directly translated. Yeah. Yes. As far as I'm concerned, there's no history of mon corps, mon choix before the English, so it must I'm, be a, a French translation. Yeah, I, I, I um, well, it is a French. Tra- it's a direct translation. I would need to actually. Well, I should probably check in with friend of the show, Mitch. Mitch, um, Mitch does uh, il parle français très bien, and maybe he can uh, let us know because the French. I mean, it's a correct translation. It is a direct translation from the English, but I. I have just a little bit of French and I don't, but I don't, I agree with you. I think it probably is likely not really a quote unquote thing. I don't think that's a phrase like it is in English. My body, my choice is a very distinctly American progressive, not just idea, but the the phrasing, like it's a, it's a mimetic chunk that when you see that, you know, when somebody says that, particularly with a hashtag in front of it to break, to finally get to the hashtag there, you're, you know, mm. I'm tweeting about it. I'm, I'm, posting about it on Instagram. I'm doing all the things. And like, that is, that is, it it, it means something. It has a literal meaning of Mm. body belonging to me, choice belonging to me, but it also has a much bigger um, sort of semiotic uh, force behind it. So we'll bring in some Ferdinand de Saussure, who is French speaking, but is actually Swiss. So he's not French. Uh, uh, So to bring in some Saussure, like this, there's the literal meaning of the words, and then there's what that phrase, quote unquote, means, and it's connected to all of the progressive stuff that we've been talking, that you've been quite nicely elucidating. Um, 
to see for me to see that firstly put into english I mean, the eiffel tower crazy i mean I guess in a way we finally beat the French down to the point where they're willing to accept that, but I don't feel happy in that victory because it's a for a, a culture of death, but weird. I actually, this is the one time where I want the French to kind of be like, fuck the English and, and Americans a little bit. Like I actually kind of want them to like push back and like the, like in the traditional tr like French Catholic sense of like, no, you're not going to do this to us. But um, then to also see right before we started recording, um, I, I was looking into it. They also, I guess had it, it was flashing in both languages because they have, like you said, they have this French version. The French version, it feels very fake because I don't know if that's a real hashtag in France. I'm going to guess it's not. And it, it, that's clearly just a, like a Diet Coke version of what the actual version, which is is the English. Um, it, it's, I'm just... I, I, and I think in if if I have accurately, if if I've accurately analyzed that, to me, that would then mean that this is really like a cultural hegemony is being or hierarchy is being being displayed that we put the english progressive term first because that's the one that really matters and then we'll translate it into the local language it it, it is interesting as somebody who you know you asked me before we were started recording do you do linguistics and i kind of do linguistics but really i do kind of more semiotics and 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 philology and for me this is there's a clear hierarchy here um and there's also uh this i think what i had said even in the our tweet or our tweet exchanges that um that I just said something like, or at least I intended to say something like, um, you know, this is, there's always been an official, religions have their official languages, right? Like, like you you know, uh, the, the decrees Franca. from the Vatican come out in Latin, the decrees from Harvard come out in English, right? Like, it's like, boom, like you, it has to be in the official language of the mystery cult in order to be branded real. And then we will translate it into the language of the laity, right? Then we'll have the French for That's those, why... you know, but we've got to have it that's in why, English. That's why there's always been these controversies with translating of the Bible. And like, you know, in recent times when there's controversy about, say, the Christian, the Christian attitudes towards homosexuality, for example, the way people make their case, particularly people making a positive case for, you know, a homosexual and approve of an acceptance of homosexuals in, in Christianity, they go to the original languages of the bible and they really interrogate what is the meaning of these words in their original greek original hebrew so they go to these essential things that you know they're sort of glossing over the entire history and the controversy of translating uh the gospels and all that and um and you you reminded me of another this has all got me thinking about another thing about french translations of english things of like film and book titles so i've just i've just some some examples the first harry potter book in in english is called harry potter and the philosopher's stone in america it's called harry potter and the sorcerer's stone sorcerer's stone um, in french it's called and l'école sorcise a l'école des sorcières and the l'école des sorcières yeah which means the wizard school the school which is quite a at the school which of is, the wizards yeah which is quite a different thing from you know so what what is it about that that would be more conducive to french audiences it's weird philosopher's Second, stone was a was an alchemical legend that existed yes, all throughout europe yes. so like yeah, yes it's it, real yeah yeah it was, yeah. yeah exactly and another example re, a, more, a much more recent example so i was in france i i somehow managed to go on a holiday to the south of france in the summer of 2020 which is, you know, mad thinking because this, this was before vaccines and vaccine uh, restrictions at borders. This was, it's crazy to think there was a time before that, despite COVID having been a thing. This was before like masking was such a big, it's, it's weird times to look back on and think the time we had genuinely thought this is all over now. Like it, it's insane. So I managed to go on this holiday to the South of France in the summer of 2020 and have a quite a decent time just going to bars and stuff and um there was a poster for the latest james bond film which hadn't come out yet um and in english it's called no time to die and the french translation is uh, uh mourir peut attendre which means to die can wait and i think <laughs> i think that's amazing i love that yeah but it's not that's not a literal translation well, I think uh, so. So, so what, what? So, 
why have they made the effort with this these books and these films? There's probably loads of other books, but well, why have they not done that with theory. this? You know, I have a theory. Yeah, I have a theory. Yeah, let's uh, go, it, go, go for it. Yeah, yeah, because you're this is no, this is all very good, and you're uh, I'm chomping at the bit. Um, usually you want to avoid direct translations. Them, sure, and that's yeah. why like a lot of, and that's actually one of the joys for me as somebody. I don't do French very well, but um, I sure. uh, I, I do German. And, uh, you know, new Dune movie is coming out. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to read Dune in German. I want to see how they translated it. And it's actually great translation. And it's fun to approach the story from through a different, you know, linguistic lens. Um, but it's also interesting. I'm always reminded of like, oh, yeah, they're not directly translating any of this stuff because it's a good translation. And you don't want to directly translate. That sounds weird. Like there's just things you would say in Harry, Harry Potter in English that doesn't work in French or things that you would say in Dune in English that just don't work in German. Like you, of course, you have to interpret this as you translate it. That's that's how translation has always worked. But you make a really good, mm. you ask a really good question. Why the direct translation here? And I think I have a, I have, I have an idea that I think actually holds um, and I'll bring in some examples from the past, if I may. So there, the, uh, this 100% this connects, I promise. So uh, one of the, mm -hmm. uh, so if the, the, the Ostrogoths, the, the, the Germanic tribes that were on the eastern part, the, sort of the eastern borders of the Roman Empire, uh, throughout, uh, once, you know, once, uh, you know, Christianity is given privileged status, and then becomes, uh, later becomes the official religion of, um, of the Roman Empire, uh, you have uh, this huge controversy of uh, Arianism, and you get things like the Nicene Creed, you know, Council of Nicaea coming out of that, because Arianism is a problem. People who reject the Trinity. I did an episode, uh, a couple episodes, or one episode ago on the show, all about that. So people can check that out if you're interested. Um, there, uh, one of the, the 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 Goths start converting to Christianity, but they convert to Arian Christianity, and the main missionary of Arian Christian Christianity to the Goths was named Wulfilas, um, or Wulfila, Wulfilas in 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 the in the Greek. Um he uh we have actually one of the the the, the only real text that we have of the Gothic language, at least larger text, is a partially surviving New Testament translation. Um done supposedly by Wulfila or at least his dudes. So Arians translating the Bible. It's weird when you are learning Gothic, as I did in graduate school, um, it's a great language. You're uh, reading this text and you're learning the Gothic words and you're learning the Gothic vocabulary, and then you're comparing it to the Greek, right? You're translating out from the Greek. And you realize that while the, the words are Gothic, the word order is completely Greek. And there's always this big, and there's this big sort of con another controversy is what was Gothic word order like? How did the Goths actually speak their language? Because the surviving records we have are so influenced by Greek. And so you, there was kind of an aha moment I had when, when you finally realized that the reason the word order is so weird and strange and doesn't look like any of the other related languages to Gothic is because the translators are purposely copying Greek word order as literally as possible. It's a literal translation of the Greek New Testament into Gothic. Why would you do that? Because Greek is the privileged language. It's the original language of the text. So any translation is not designed to sound like what people actually speak. That's an innovation that comes with people like Luther and the Protestant Reformation. We translate how people would actually talk. No, no, no. We're going to literally translate it. You can also see this to bring it back to England. Um, you can see this in Old English um, translations of like we have, you know, surviving uh, Psalms and stuff like that that were translated from the Latin. So fine, they're going via the Latin, via St. Jerome's Vulgate. Okay. But even then, those Old English translations of, out of the, the, the Latin Vulgate are really Latin sounding in terms of the, not of their words, but in terms of the word order. It's artificial. It's strange. Mm. Why would you do this? Well, you're designed, this is designed to help Anglo-Saxon monks get better at Latin, so even the translation is going to mirror the Latin as close as possible. Again, in both instances, Greek in the East, Latin in the West, why are you doing this? Because those are the holy languages. Those are the liturgical languages, right? The, 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 the this, you know, divine liturgy in the East is done in Greek, particularly in like, you know, the Eastern half of uh, the in Byzantine Empire, right? Or the, the Eastern half of Rome. And then in the West, it's Latin, Latin. So, even the, the 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 vernacular translations are kind of there's always this big asterisk. People who are in my field always have to say, okay, the word order we is difficult because the the surviving 
examples of these old languages we have are so influenced by either Latin or Greek that they're almost kind of like it's not what people would have spoken on the street. What is it the hell does this have to do with the Moncomochoa? Well, this is a, a modern example of that. The French is so weird and like directly coming out of the English because it's not really designed to be authentically French. It's designed to point sure. French speakers to the liturgical language. And the, as I said, the liturgical language of progressivism is, is American English. Messages or prayers or anything like that are translated. Um, you get sure. a emphasis on literal translation over a dynamic equivalent translation because you're trying to point and orient people to the source. And I think here they're pointing people, whether they want to or not, they're pointing the French to the source, which is not France, <laughs> or at least point, not originally. The point is, the point is that these uh, these um, advocates for abortion in a contemporary context so as we know it now because there are there are many contexts in which people might you know advocate for abortion the one we have now is part of this global religion that is very transcendent of national boundaries national cultures and customs and the way you can look at the physical it's inverted reactions Christianity. Of you can look at the physical reactions of people in these protests uh, in argentina there's recently or we've had some abortion rallies and in france and you can there's probably not a lot of difference in like their brain chemistry if you were to scan their brains or something like so yeah so yeah and, well, they're, and they're all suffering you, since, yeah go ahead sorry go ahead. since you're talking about word order i've just picked up this thing it might just be it might be nothing but it might be something so one of the other things that's being projected on the eiffel tower is um evg constitution so constitution is the French constitution. IVG, as we've spoken about, we spoke about this before we started recording, is the French for abortion, which I didn't know. And in other Romance languages, IVG in Italian and Portuguese. And But it says EVG constitution, but usually the word order would be constitution EVG because the descriptor tends to come after a noun. The attribute, the attribution, attribution, sorry, tends to come after the noun in French, doesn't it? Yeah, attributive adjectives, yeah. They go so after. is do you think that do you think that is some? Am I reading too much into that? Do you think? I actually am not going to say because I think it's a fascinating sure. idea. We need to bring Mitch on, and Mitch can, who's sure. who's, a, who's very good at French, can could 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 uh could with his PhD in French, could linguistics could help us with that because I don't is it I don't know French well enough. Has, to, in the, another yeah. one is yeah, it says hashtag EVG Constitution. But I'm thinking the French, the yeah, the the attribute. Constitution EVG sounds noun. more idiomatically French. Yes. Yeah, to me. Yes, yeah. because the because the um. Actually, well, sometimes yes, adjectives some do come before nouns in French before sometimes. But, but there's a hand. Usually, it's a handful. You, usually, yeah. usually the attributive ones come afterwards. So uh, yeah, I'm. Yeah. If it's an attributive noun, especially, I'm yeah. I I found that. In from like a word or perspective, but yeah, it goes back to the full thing. No, and it is it is weird to have. It is weird, and so it's it could totally be connected to this this hyper literal translation mm -hmm. thing that you get when you know, and you get it when um historically you get it when when peoples and cultures are newly being converted, right? Because if you think of like Luther's big emphasis on translating the Bible into a German that Germans could actually understand. That is yeah. that is a a reformation idea. It's not a first con. It's not a we need to get the culture converted idea, right? Uh, in the, sure. the Middle Ages was all the early Middle Ages particularly was all about like let's get these people to stop sacrificing. Ironically, their kids. Um, so and now it's come full circle into we have to get them to do that. So we're gonna have to you know literally we're gonna have to go as literal as possible to plug these people into the way the progressive way of doing things. And if that means butchering your or doing weird weird translations and or butchering your your language, we don't care because it's not about you. It's about the thing we're pointing to. Look at the original. I I can't help but think that this is so, so I so I'm thinking now, we've spoken about all this stuff and I think, well, what is this religion? And you said inverted Christianity. I just think this is the religion of Satan. 
Well, that is, but yeah, because, it's the it, it, well, in, Antichrist, like the spirit of Antichrist. Sure, yes. Like, yeah. This yeah. is, this is, and it's a shame that you, most people, even people that are slightly more, you know, critical, uh, sorry, yeah, critical of liberalism, not sympathetic to liberalism, will sort of roll their eyes when people talk about Satan. Um, but uh, I, it, it needs to be more normalized because, you know, because people just think about Satanism and they just think about, I don't know, sexual, sexual sins. Um, but there's more to it than that. Because if you actually look at the things that the devil actually said when he was tempting Jesus, it wasn't just like temptations of the flesh. It was, it was like, um, turn this stone into bread. Which you uh, could say is a temptation of the hungry. flesh. Right, yeah, for it hunger. is a temptation of the flesh for him to eat it, but it's also a temptation for him to do these, you know, essentially use these unearthly powers to, you know, turn a rock into bread, which we, we, we can't do. Well, yeah. And, um, it, well, and like, do, like, do, always... do, do yeah. magic tricks. Like, Basically. And do, temptations... For, for, for yeah, very for selfish, whimsical reasons. You yeah, know? temptations are always, uh, as opposed to turning water into wine, which is great for everyone, so... Um, of, course, of course, it's a joke, yeah. but it's also true. Um, yeah, no, but I, I think you know, temptations are always um, are always shortcuts, right? Like it's a shortcut mm. to it's a shortcut to the thing that you want, but in so doing, you lose the thing you want, right? And that's that's from the very beginning, right? Like that's that's we want knowledge of good and evil. Okay, well, this is the shortcut to that. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't really get but, knowledge. We lost our ability to now even properly know what's true because we're all muddled in our knowing. We know too. We all we know too much, and we don't even know what's right anymore. Right? That's you know. You could think of because that's an interpretation of the fall, but I think it holds. Like, sure. it, and, and I mean, this is a, it's an appropriate. I'm glad you brought this up because we're during in Lent, and it's an appropriate time to start thinking about that. So yeah, I I think yeah people people take a too literal and i mean lewis writes about this too um c.s lewis yeah. that, that, that people take a well the man in red it's like yeah but that's that's like a real like that's like a you know a a saturday morning cartoon version of what the devil and, and yes. evil is. it's if like you, that, you know it's not yeah if you, it's if not you make really if you talking about if you make it about you know the such a literal appearance physical appearance then you're taking attention away from the things that are more subtle, which is, oh yeah, the, the the more subtle influences of Satan, which are more ultimately the ones that they should be more vigilant against. Yes, like like this is a criticism that a friend of mine. I was talking to an American friend of mine about like the very theatrical, very um, dramatic uh, worship in like American Baptist black baptist churches like yeah. gospel music and all that yep and he's like if you're making it so much about the way you feel you feel you, like you're, you're making it about very earthly feelings and you're taking it, it's it's more than just feelings you know it's more than about the physical gratification in church i can you know? see that i can see that but i i, I, I can see yeah. that but i can also say not disagreeing with that point but i can sure. also say you t it tends to be those churches, that tradition, yes. that acknowledges mm. the reality of Satan. And yes, no, they do. Forces. They so, do. So there's also Sorry, yes. other, but they're it's also more... way more likely to acknowledge, to call evil evil and recognize that it's a force that yes. is natural and is working outside of natural things. Um, yes, it's, so, uh, it's certainly true. You know, certainly true that these uh, not, these, not today, uh, Satan. Not today, Satan uh -huh. is, is 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 comes out of that's an African American saying that has now become sort of a just really a yeah yeah that's 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 a that's out oh, of yes I yeah so I'm cer I'm certainly not saying I'm certainly not saying this to I wasn't sorry I wasn't trying to imply that uh, black churches in America are no I, I'm more, not I was, more, I'm more just... um are more you know <laughs> vulnerable to Satan it's more I, I a think point I think about, it's actually the white progressive about, churches point... white progressive churches are the ones that are the most vulnerable let's be yes. perfectly no. honest I mean oh, yeah. yes the, yeah, it's, yes yeah. well the progressive yeah. churches are more likely to be the white ones unfortunately yeah. yeah um it was more it wasn't I wasn't really making a point about Satan but the idea about making the the a message more about a kind of physical reaction or a physical stimulus and uh it and it was a it was you know it was a bit of a no, i know what you meant really. i wasn't but, um, to disagree but, uh, i was just pointing out yeah. and yes it is it is true that yeah black churches are going to be the ones that are more vigilant about satan full stop oh, but yeah. they will 
but they might but then that's the thing they might think that satan's influence is something that you will always feel right like you'll always detect it but the point is that no the point is you sometimes can and sometimes it's much more subtle so mm -hmm. so um and uh, like yeah you just all these things like the the these things about these are these are this religion that is per, uh, perpetuating abortion throughout the world uh is is just like the tower of babel and well demos you know, if the god of progressivism is demos we he has many names and he's been known by many names throughout the centuries uh sure. he's a man of wealth and, and taste as mick jagger would say um you know uh, if if his if one of his avatars is demos i will say and and that's the particular incarnation or, or not even incarnation just the particular spirit that we're encountering here i will say demos is a very thirsty god demos is thirsty for blood See, I, I mean, just, the amount of blood that Demos needs to keep going is like, that's a lot. It's a very, find, very thirsty spirit. I find it hard to... Sorry, I should have said that in Alex Jones' voice, but uh, Demos is very thirsty, but it's true. I mean, come on. No, I, I'm, I'm one of these people that is a little more skeptical about these denunciations of democracy because I think a lot of what people call democracy today both both in the affirmative and the negative are clearly you know the rules of elite people that are perpetuating values that are easily taken up by people in a way that might not be described as democracy may some people right. say well that is that is the way it can only be like that is there's no the the way the human condition does not allow for people as a whole to come together and create a genuine sort of aggregated consensus it's just not physically possible that i can say is like a, a reasonable rebuttal to what i'm saying but um yeah i do especially given what, what i was going back to saying about uh, woodrow wilson and his ideas about sovereign administration being the next stage of the evolution of liberalism which had been the in an intermediate period where it had been the sovereignty of people in the democratic era. He's like Marx considers himself a scientist and he's writing about the evolution of capitalism social and communism as just this natural process like like photosynthesis well, for him, it, it's or inevitable or, for these people because the they life are cycle of it. a plant or it's the life inevitable. cycle of a plant they're not they're yeah. not trying to well, but that well well with specifically with marx and socialism and communism there's obviously this contradiction because they say that it's just an inevitable process that you can't that you can't uh, work against but then it also requires us to imperatively say you know organize actively voluntarily do all these things to yeah. to obviously this process is inevitable but could you right. just give it a little push in the right direction like <laughs> yeah. so obviously there's a contradiction there well the, the, like, and, the, yeah, and I, yeah. yeah there's this weird kind of like um well this is probably a topic for another day you might i don't even know how you feel there's sure. a quasi calvinist quality to all of that but yeah of, of the, no yes it's inevitable yes. yet we still have to be good yet we still have to yet it's inevitable yes. yet we still have to be good and it's this weird you know this the is, tension you find in in hyper calvinist theology you also find in in leftism this, leftism of this strange what does the will matter thing, kind of question yeah calvinism is such a sort of knife edge thing there's so many ways i've heard that calvinism is the absolute essence of communism and all the horrors of the modern world but then there's these complete there's this other side of things where everyone says communist calvinist influence communist essence is the antithesis of that and i think of like switzerland which is a very has quite a calvinist influence it's still in mixed. It, sort of it's mixed no it's mixed yeah but but if there is this or if i've heard my father sort of argue with this a lot and i i need to be more informed about it but um i the way that the calvinist influence and the idea about will is something that is the antithesis of this kind of totalitarian way of thinking i know mm -hmm. this sounds like i haven't re re 
I you're going to get a very biased take researched from me. about it. You should sure. you should talk to me. you should research something more 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 neutral because I have a yes. very sharp. I mean, from all my... I got to say is if if I were alive in the in the in the English Civil War, I would totally hop on a horse and charge against the Republicans. I mean, I, I would be a royalist 100. percent And not even because oh, Charles course, was so yes. great, but because because Cromwell was so bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a difficult one for me. Uh, I I I find I I need to re I need to really get to grips more with what I think about the Civil War, that, partic that particular Civil War. Obviously, there's a series of English Civil Wars, including the English Civil War of, uh, like, the American War of Independence. Yes. Which is another, which is another English Civil War. Well, it's, anyway. it's the natural outpouring <laughs> of that one. Yeah, yeah, anyhow. Exactly, exactly. And thank well, God hey, a topic for else. a topic for, for a future episode. I'd love <laughs> to have you I get a British thank perspective you. on that, so. Exactly. Um, so... But, yeah, yeah, so it's, to to start maybe just to start turning the, the the corner to to wrap it up a bit, like not to cut you off in any way, but like, yeah, sure. um, I I do think I think I love that you. I'm gonna pat you on the back. I love that you pointed this out. Mm -hmm. It's a thing that was, it was one of those. I think that this is why it's a good insight. I think is because it's an insight that I hadn't thought about. To be fair, I wasn't following the story, but. If I no, had, I wasn't following but, it either. Yeah, but it, it's something that is so simple and clearly true. It's a it's a true dynamic. Yes. I'm like, now I can't unsee it. I'm I will definitely be seeing but this it's... elsewhere now because it's so simple and just there in front of you. But you you have to want to see it. And until you and sometimes it takes you know your plucky British friend being like, look at it. It's like Bird Box. Look but at it. You're like, well, now I can't unsee it. Like I've it's a real dynamic. I'm, I'm, I did a search on social media. Or on, on like on YouTube, I, I'm look. I've got this video YouTube. open right now of YouTube, YouTube, oh, YouTube of of like this. Here's a video of the Eiffel Tower on this day, whenever it was. I can't remember. And I just look in the comments, and nobody is asking the question, "Why is it in English?" Yeah, why is it in there's, English? There's there's virtually no people just asking this question. Like if it were and, in English in Amsterdam, wouldn't bat an eye. The Dutch are very mo multilingual. If it was in English in Stockholm, wouldn't bat an eye. Oslo wouldn't bat an eye. Copenhagen wouldn't bat an eye. Even like Berlin, I don't, well, Berlin would be like, oh, well, okay. I don't, but but Paris, I that's notable. I would not. I would. I would still think it would be significant, even it, no, if it was. My point is, I, is not that it wouldn't be yeah. significant. My point is that it's sure. the most significant because it's in one of the least. Sure. It's yes. one of the most anglophobic places on the planet. Yes. <laughs> and that's what I'm there trying is, to say. No, there yeah. is. There is. Yeah. Uh, yes, there is. There are minimal. There, there's a few overlaps in the culture of France and England, of course, but it oh, is yeah, also I mean, the place. The place that it would be. Even as especially, I mean, yeah, the French have never stopped being just so weird. Uh, if I can, <laughs> like, if I can say that they just are so fucking weird. But yes, this, yeah, this is. I it's why it, there are other people just not pointing this out. Why is why is this in English? You know, is anyone are any of the people at the rally? What if what would you these people at the rallies who are so caught up in it, so engaged. What would they say, do you think, if you said to them, why does it say that in English? Do you think they would, what, do you think they would just be like a lot of liberals when they're confronted, loads of liberals on like podcasts and stuff, they get confronted with these questions, these difficult questions, and they just have absolutely no idea what to say. They they literally, there was one example of a girl on a podcast and she, she was asked, like, define misogyny. And she said nothing for about ten seconds, and then she said, "I'd like, I'd, I'd like, I'd like to leave." Like, these are these these people are just like are these people just like robots. That I mean, they, I, they have I, absolutely I think, no original thoughts whatsoever. I think if this, you were this, to get what, yeah. this religion, this religion is more controlling than any projection that these people have of like archaic historical religions controlling oh, yeah. the way you think, like. These people are fucking automatons. It's well, just it's insane. a it's yeah. a religion that is so metaphysically strong that the physical controls it's, can be lax. It's really quite scary. Mm -hmm. The mimetic you... power behind it's quite, and it's very infectious. It's very contagious. A lot of it's, a lot of a, it. It's a religion that almost doesn't even have to be. It kind of propagates. It almost propagates itself because it's so trendy. It, the, and it doesn't really is, ask much of you. There's definitely something about uh, the influence of technological advances in media 
and social media is so helpful for propagation because obviously the printing press was this you know revolution in propagating ideas well this is like the printing press on fucking steroids you know so, everyone's got it on yeah. their phone you know like it's a there must unfortunately be this that's this huge i mean people maybe yeah. social media alone is the reason for so called you know the the woke the great awakening as people like to call it which started like late 2015 the sort of thing maybe you could just say this wouldn't have happened without social media or if social media uh, had been more advanced 10 years like just the you know, propagation of this stuff you know i mean yeah we're there's so much here for future episodes that i don't want yes, and I, yes. yeah, um I, I would say something like if there is a white pill and i like to end episodes even depressing ones like this with something of a of a white pill i think the, if course. there is a white pill i think it could be i'm not going to say what it is but i think it could be we hold out hope mm -hmm. not assurance but hope um I think it could be something like social media has accelerated this so quickly that it's making everything worse really fast. And that is just objectively true. However, this is a self-destructive system. And it's, I think, not only does it hasten the end of the system, or could potentially, I think it also is one of these things where there's so much of this messaging being hit at you, all, like thrown at you all the time, once you can start to really see it and go, oh, this is clearly just whatever. This is clearly just another example of, you know, th this religious mm. fervor. When you can start to, and then this is something that I think we, like people, uh, or me and Elliot on the show have been pushing for for a while. If you can re-enchant the world enough to see that there's a real spiritual battle happening and that this is all not just people doing things. This is something driving people to do things the examples that they keep throwing at you in order to convince you of its legitimacy actually get less legitimate because you can start to see that these people are almost i'm not going to say they're not culpable but they're almost they're not really making these decisions for themselves i think there's something else behind it no. that the more they throw at you the more evidence you have of it being something spiritual and as to bring it back to what we were saying earlier right like demonic temptation works best when you don't realize what it is when you think it's you, you think it's just your friends, or you think it's just what needs to happen, right? It works the best when you don't see it for what it is. So maybe the increased messaging also increases the, 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 could theoretically increase the awareness of it, but that has to do with making people start to see that. So that's the challenge. I sure. Think. Yeah. yeah. My, I, I, I do appreciate the idea of finding the white pill and, uh, you have I, to. Well, I, you know, I was very angry for a lot of 2021. We're Tolkien pills on this channel. We of, find, we find the white yeah. pill. We find Gandalf, and we hope that Gandalf I, will crest the hill on the third day, right? We, we want this. Of course. And I was very angry in that time. And on top of that, I did genuinely have, eventually had some, some things come up in my personal life that sort of forced me to not be able to think about politics very much and be saddened by more immediate stimuli which made me realize, no, you can't just think about politics all the time and just ignore your own life and be really self-indulgent. Yep. And, um, and that helped me not, not actually the bad stuff happening to me, but I, you know, I was obviously aware of this before that just constant consciously, you can't just be sad forever because that's so fucking self-indulgent. So that's childish. Also the goal. That's also the it's, goal. And it, and it, yes, there must be a way that they, that they would want you to be that way. Yep. So you can't do that. So yes, I fully appreciate that. In this case, like, I mean, the the more obvious things is that they they talk about this new thing in France as being such an unprecedented thing. The the fact that it's a constitutional right to abortion. I mean, clearly, constitutions have you know by proxy or i or maybe directly sort of done the same thing so no there's not this isn't like an unprecedented thing this is just an extension of some other legal thing that's happened in other countries in you know in argentina and ireland so no this isn't such an unprecedented thing in fact it's actually been quite helpful to show the to kind of show off the uh, the silliness of it with as we were saying why is it in english that's not something we would have necessarily seen because either it could just be on people's signs or something it could be maybe we might look at the signs and there might be a couple in english maybe we wouldn't have thought about that the signs people hold up on on cardboard but the fact that it's projected on the eiffel tower has made it has 
has sort of shown shown this silliness about this obvious silliness and make that that's that must be a sort of good thing because you can point to that out to people and that will probably make them think just a little bit that there's something weird about this yep or that it, this isn't really about abortion per se i mean obviously that's the goal but i mean and well it's about it's about getting people under it's just about increasing the influence as much as possible of this religion because abortion is supposedly it's a sacrament you know it's a sacrament and it's also uh it's tantamount to some sort of freedom yeah of course people who talk about being pro choice they never ever talk about the many 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 times that people have abortions that they don't want that are forced to have an abortion yeah as opposed to the force to have a pregnancy and this has happened to some quite high profile cases uh, there are two cases that i like to bring up the first is um the first is judy garland first of all right, yeah. when her mother when her mother was pregnant with her uh the family didn't want another child and they were literally trying they could they didn't they weren't the legal means to get an abortion they were literally trying to drive around uh aggressively in their parents car for to induce a miscarriage in her mother and uh of so people who advocate for abortion would have to for like the most stringent sort the least stringent restrictions on abortion would have to think that julie garland judy garland's mother was was uh was you know deprived of not being able to abort judy garland and of course judy garland herself when she first got pregnant with I think it was her first husband. I can't remember who he was. Uh, she was forced to have an abortion because she was in show business. And then more recently, of course, there's Britney Spears' autobiography that came out and has given the revelation that she got pregnant when she was in a relationship with Justin Timberlake and she wanted the baby. And he and her father obliged her to get this this sort of botched home abortion and she it was so traumatic for her and this hasn't been known about until now and then people just the 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 pro choice people will not think that that constitutes like part of their pro choice ideas you know it's a, so it's the fact that it's only ever in the affirmative for abortion that choice goes rather than the many time like like forced abortion that could could is is used in so many horrible ways like like abortion could be used to cover up the tracks of a, a man who's had an affair Often and times. got another woman like how many women are forced to get abortions on that basis it, it also is you i mean man, like, we're really if this if yeah. this episode gets my show taken down it's fucking worth it uh it's also used to yes. uh, cover up pedophilia quite often of course of course like the it's ugh. Okay, so. we're just talking about abortion more than this actual thing. Yeah, but um, but, 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 but I mean, horrible. this is but this but, is uh, but this yes. is but this is the enemy, right? Like this is the, the yes, the enemy. It's important. I think I think maybe this is a way to to wrap it up. The white pill is that the enemy is becoming very more and more evident, and the enemy ultimately is not these people. These people are in the clutches of the enemy. The no. enemy is something bigger than them. I I just feel the enemy has infected them. You know, enemy is controlling I feel so i feel very sorry for i feel bad for them you should feel you bad know, and you I should do. love it's, them it's, it's it, you should not because even if they're the most yeah. you know horrifically pro abortion person they're something people aren't born i don't people are born fallen but they're not born like that there's something happened something went on yes, no yes like that's something, that's, a, that's something occurred to them um it's it's similar yeah. to how I recently read this, saw this thing, on, this is to do with being fallen and stuff. Like, I saw this thing on Twitter, it was one of those long tweets from someone that has bought, you know, their, their subscription. They were talking about how they went to the third world, to live in the third world, and they naively thought it would be sort of nice and tropical. But then they saw loads of horrible things like, you know, parents selling their kids, and they saw sort of child prostitution and so much abject poverty and all that. And uh, they, they're, in, they're sort of a lib person. Their interpretation of this was, this was all of human history. Majority, for a majority of the population, people live like this. And I was like, no. No. <laughs> this isn't, no, that's not true. This is not the state of nature. This is the 
this is the dregs of of uh, global de post-war global development programs yeah. not not working as intent working as they were always going to work but not yeah. as intended this is not the state of nature this is this is something that has an essence amen and um disrespect so, ngos daily yes ngos like this is disrespect not disrespect them daily yeah this is not but no this isn't a state of nature but that's not to say that this, yes people do terrible things under the influence of like a culture that is so historic like the, obviously these are people that are acting uh in their the places they live which have had their cult their sort of you know uh this their historical heritage cultures overturned by liberal republicanism that's to yep. come in and told them that they need to be an independent republic to be you know dignified citizens of the world and they've obviously it's just it turned everything to shit so they're yep. they're acting under a, fa a very thin sort of cultural foundation well obviously think... not not yep. all not all not all long cultural foundations are good like if you go to papua new guinea and there are places which have not been touched by any external cultures and they're like doing these horrible sex rituals like disgusting stuff obviously that's it's not that by default but yes th this this stuff is not not all you know horrible things well, are just people being poor like, and maybe like, and yeah yeah and maybe the fact that it's happening in france will yes it's a little bit closer to home it's just close france enough is now home. it's close enough france to is home. becoming more more and more third world yep. you know <laughs> well this is again there's there's black pills and white pills at the end here that's okay you can yes do, 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 do. well it's, it's 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 both they, it's i just can't help but see this as like a chink in the armor they've they've put this yes. english thing on this big thing and they shouldn't have done that i maybe yeah. there's someone being fired for it yeah know. who knows well, maybe, well, but you know, I mean, it's not, no, it's not really any skin off their back, but like we have noticed this weird thing. And if that might, that is the likely thing that other people, other sort of normies, if you will, will yeah. see and think may, might genuinely be convinced that it's a bit weird, you know? Yep. Why is cool. that in English? You well, know? Fred, thanks yes. for coming on. Well, let's have you on again. Oh, thanks for having me. I've really no, enjoyed like it. I've not, had a, I've not had a discussion like this in a while. Oh, no, it's been yeah, good. It's doable. It's, yeah, it's thanks, a, man. Yeah. Um, do you want to do you want to uh, tout your your newly recreated Twitter presence or not? We'll leave it up to you. I know you keep you go through them like Skittles. No, I do. Yes, yeah. I've genuinely had a new account on every other episode. Every new episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. The new one I have is um, is a a re, a, a sequel to an old account I had. The first sequel I've done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's in space so this, this is, time. Yeah, this is Feather, Feathers McGraw too. Cool. Uh, which is uh, MC six A, sorry, MC six R A W I I. But I will leave you to type that as well. Yeah, I'll type it out. Some sort of description to cool. yes. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, but yes, I I'm on Twitter and that's where most of my stuff. Will yeah, be. check out Fred. Yeah. He's very 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 uh, witty, and, uh, <laughs> and and very English. I try my best. Yeah, try my best. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, please, if you've watched this long and and put up with the Aspergers, we appreciate that. Please like, comment, subscribe, all those things. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll be back. I, I I think the schedule of of podcasts we might do a little bit fewer. Um, Elliot's been busy, but that's okay. We'll have him on again. Mitch will be back on at some point here, and definitely we'll we'll harangue Fred to 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 log on in the evening his time, and we'll do stuff. So, all right, sure, everyone, man. have a great rest of your weekend week whenever this drops. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Peace.